Faith Matters. An interactive program brought to you by MTA International. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another edition of Faith Matters where you, our viewers on MTA, set the agenda by the questions you ask. Jazakum Allah and thank you for the questions you've been sending in. But just as a reminder to our viewers, the email address for questions, thoughts, observations or indeed any comments you may have, it's faithmatters at mta.tv. Faith Matters, one word, at mta.tv. We have been asked about previous Faith Matters programs. Well, I'm delighted to not just tell you, but indeed remind you that you can find these now on YouTube. Go to YouTube, MTA Online 1, Faith Matters, and put in the subject you're after, and hopefully you'll find the question being answered just then. If not, you know what to do. Faith Matters at mta.tv. With that small introduction, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome back to Faith Matters, to familiar faces on the program. Assalamu alaikum, gentlemen. Welcome to Faith Matters. Of course, as many viewers will recognize, to my immediate right is Dr. Zayed Khan Sahib, who is the president of the UK Qazar Board. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Sahib. Wa alaikum salam. And to his right is always a welcome guest on uh, Faith Matters. A pleasure once again to welcome Molana Ayaz Mahmood Khan Sahib, who is a missionary here in the United Kingdom. Assalamu alaikum, Ayaz Sahib. Gentlemen, um, we're going to continue with one of. As you are well aware, sometimes we theme particular programs. And we're going to continue with a theme which were on allegations which have been raised against the uh, noble character of the Holy Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And linked to that also other allegations which are sometimes made against um, the faith of Islam. Um, I did promise one of our, uh, this particular questioner that we would return to her question. This is Kay in London. Thank you, Kay, for your question. You raised the issue of the uh, special tax known as jizya uh, on the previous program, and I did say we would return to it, and we are doing just that. Um, Dr. Saab, if I could start with you on this. Kay writes that she refers back to the, and rightly so, that there is a verse in the Holy Quran that this says there is no compulsion, coercion in religion. Yet she then asks, why does Islam or Islamic governments as such, or governance under an Islamic jurisdiction, um, talk about whilst insist on making Hajj on pilgrimage to Mecca? She then says that Islam is a religion of peace and tolerance of people, and calls for tolerance of people rather like Jews and Christians amongst others. Yet, she then says, they are then required, i.e. non-Muslims, to pay a jizya, a special tax, which is then levied on them. Now, why and where did this, first of all, originate from? If you could briefly talk about that, and perhaps for the benefit of viewers, and particularly for Kay, what is jizya, why is it levied, and what's it used for? Is I suppose uh, often we talk about tax. I, I know from personal experience that, you know, how do you spend our money is one of the questions which people ask, but also, on the more serious point, how people who aren't of the Islamic faith feel their money is being used. Yes, I think historically nobody likes to pay tax and people always question as to how the taxes are being spent and whether it is spent in the right manner and, and, and what. But as far as Islamic uh, society is concerned, is Islam promotes a society where there is equality, where there is peace and there is harmony in a society. Uh, but to go with that, obviously, uh, there are certain conditions that are li uh, uh, laid down in society to ensure for instance, that there is protection that is given to the inhabitants of a society. And when we look at uh, a jizya in a multi-faith society, then one understands that this is for the protection of the people in that particular society. The Islamic form of uh, financing the zakat is something that is incumbent, obligatory, on every Muslim to pay, whether male or female, in that sense but uh, non-Muslims are totally exempt from paying zakat because it is not part of their faith that they have okay. to pay zakat. So in order for non-Muslims to remain in a peaceful society and for their protection, jizya was a very minor tax that was levied on non-Muslims living in an Islamic society and it was for their protection. The other thing is that Muslims obviously had to do military service in a society for the protection of the nation 
and non-Muslims again are exempt from this arduous task. If you go back to the history of Islam and look at the conditions of war at that time, this was a very tough condition that Muslims had to fulfill. So non-Muslims were totally exempt from going out to protect, these, protect the society. But there were many exemptions that were given to, to non-Muslims as far as jizya is concerned. The poor did not have to pay jizya at all. Women did not have to pay jizya at all. Children also did not have to pay jizya at all according to um, Imam Abu Hanifa. The priests did not have to pay jizya at all. So there are numerous exemptions and the jizya that was collected was from a very small percentage of the population. In zakat, there were no exemptions. As I, as I have said, that women were not exempt from paying zakat. If they had property and wealth, they, <coughs> they too had to pay zakat on, on, on that aspect. So they also had to do military service, the Muslims. So there is this difference uh, of actions that they had to do in, in that respect. What is the contribution of jizya? Again, the jurists have given answers on, on this, and it is said to be one dinar per year. Uh, one of the imams has said that it is one dinar. Uh, Imam Shafi has laid this down. So that is a very minor contribution that one had to make in order to get the protection that was given to every citizen of a Muslim society. So in order to promote peace, in order for people to live in that peaceful society, non-Muslims made a very minor contribution of jizya to that respect. But there were always exemptions in that respect. And the Muslim rulers, obviously, mm -hmm. if they felt that other people were deserving of this exemption, were always given this exemption and given the protection that they rightly deserved in an Islamic peaceful society at that time. I'll come back to the rate with the Yasser mm -hmm. in a moment, but with yourself, if I just perhaps also for our viewers' understanding. So this, we're talking about a system of Islamic governance. We're talking about an Islamic or a Muslim government being in place. And this is much the same as a tax system which is then used subsequently to be spent on what? For not just the protection, but for facilities and the provision of Absolutely. facilities. Absolutely. I mean, all the facilities that society provides mm -hmm. to its inhabitants has to be uh, brought from somewhere. So in order for that to undertake, the, the, these systems, financial systems were set, set in place to provide all these facilities and amenities uh, for the use of the inhabitants uh, overall so that people were able to actually see the benefits of that society and system. And if you look at the hi early history of Islam, everybody, I mean, raises their hats to the Islamic uh, forms of uh, systems that were in place and the uh, how advancements that society had gone through because of these ideals that had been put in place from the time of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Jazakallah. Ya Saab, if I could bring you in here, I mean one of the things that Doc Saab has so eloquently highlighted is this issue of social justice which prevailed, the fact that people were exempt, there was a safety net to ensure that people who weren't able to pay certainly weren't compelled to pay. So that issue of compulsion, uh, that it was a universal tax certainly isn't the case on non-Muslims. But Kay also points to a particular um, hadith where she says that uh, about giving the Jewish community, as was the case, a valley to farm and then charging them half of everything. So she suggests that was a, a almost suggesting a 50% income tax. There you are, there's the land, go and farm it, but you know what, we're going to take 50% of the proceeds. Actually, the hadith which she is referring to is about the famous valley of Khaber, which was a Jewish settlement, a Jewish community. It was one of the strongholds of the Jewish community at that time. In the Arab society in those days, uh, society's strength was judged based on the number of fortresses that they had and their military strength. And that was all present in Khaber to a very high degree. Now, in order for us to understand the context and circumstances in which the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, levied this restriction or tax on that Jewish community of Khaybar, we have to put into context the whole historical background of that era. And this is something which maybe if I said of my own accord, somebody would say that I am biased. But Western Orientalist scholars have also mentioned this in their historical works as well of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. We have to understand that when the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, came to Medina, mm -hmm. he did not just come and begin taxing everybody. 
The first thing that he did was that he established a charter of rights with three different communities. There was the Muslim community, there was the Jewish community, and then the idolatrous community. All of them had rights to continue living their lives as they so willed, with no religious restrictions. They were free to practice whatever religion they wanted. They were free to conduct their lives just as before. And through, by virtue of this treaty, which was the Charter of Medina, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, was perhaps the first man who established a Charter of Human Rights and lived and co-inhabited with multiple societies as if they were one big society. Mm -hmm. And no historian is oblivious to this fact. They admit that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, conducted justice in Medina to such a high degree that perhaps its parallel cannot be found in the world anywhere else before that or after. When the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, came to Medina, the Jewish community of that time, which was present in Medina, began to conspire against the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. They began to hatch conspiracies to assassinate the Holy Prophet, and this is mentioned in books of Hadith mm -hmm. and in books of history, and Orientalist scholars accept this. I keep stressing that because it's not just us. Orientalist scholars, Western thinkers, have mentioned this in their works. Mm -hmm. So the Holy and not just that, some, there are some narrations where even Muslim, Muslim women were humiliated in public and that humiliation was far beyond the bounds. So is a system of conflict began to arise in Medina. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, always leaned towards forgiveness <coughs> and leniency and he would always go to the Jewish community and say to their leaders and their elders that look, we have to live together peacefully. Mm -hmm. So please get a hold of your people who are creating this mischief so that we can continue living in peace. But there's narrations that the Jewish people of that time would very arrogantly re retort to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, that who do you think you are? We'll do whatever we want. And this was despite the fact that they had agreed based on the Charter of Rights of Medina mm -hmm. that everybody would live in peace. So the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, had no choice but to say then look, if you can't live peacefully here, then move somewhere else and live. So some of the, Mus the Jewish communities moved. The Banu Nadir, which was a very famous tribe of the Jews and was present in Medina, when they left Medina, they moved to Khaybar. Okay. And the purpose of them moving there was so that we could have harmony and peace in Medina. But they didn't stop at that. When you say, just on that point, because I think it's important, when you say they moved, they weren't expelled, they chose to move or they were, how, how did that come yeah, about? The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, after many, many reminders, said that now we should come to an agreement of peace. You have already agreed based on the Charter of Medina that we should live in peace, but if you do not stop, then I will have no choice but to send you somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And the Jewish community accepted this. They said, okay. all right. And another treaty was drafted in which the Jewish community said that, all right, now if any disharmony or conflict arises, we know that our punishment is to leave. As a matter of fact, the Jewish community even knew that their, pen their penalty for their conspiracies was execution based mm -hmm. on the Arab law at that time. But the Holy Prophet took a more lenient course and said, look, I won't execute you. All I request is that now you leave Medina. And they left Medina because they knew that their punishment was far greater than what the Holy Prophet gave them. And exile, you know, exile for a tribe of Arabia is not a big deal because the Arab people were nomadic tribes. They would move wherever they could find uh, cattle or water. So it wasn't really a punishment for them to move from one place to another place. They just continued their farming there as they were doing in Medina. When they went to Medina, Tariq Sahib, they continued in their conspiracies, not Khabar. only in Khabar. When they moved to Khabar, they continued they, their conspiracies mm -hmm. and they also began to incite other Arab tribes as well to launch secret night attacks upon Medina to kill and murder the companions and to assassinate the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And Montgomery Watt, who is a very famous Orientalist scholar, he has written a book called Muhammad, the Statesman and the Statesman and the Prophet, the Prophet and the Statesman. And in that he has clearly mentioned that in Khaybar, the Jewish community was responsible for generating revenues and funds only for the purpose that it could be given to other Arab tribes and to the Quraysh so that they could commit atrocities against the Muslims and have war. So in order to stop that, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, had to travel to Khaybar to put an end to these conspiracies. But even then, Tariq Sahib, when he went there, he didn't say, okay, 
You moved from Medina because you were creating conflict and disunity. Now you're cons conspiring again, so now I'll execute you. The Holy Prophet didn't execute them, even though that was their punishment. And they knew that that mm -hmm. was their punishment because the Jewish people admitted this. But the Holy Prophet said, look, all I say is that you keep your land, you stay there, 50% of your revenues from your crops and your harvests will be given to Medina. And the only purpose of this was to put an end to the bloodshed and the violence which they had perpetrated and which they were continuing to perpetrate mm -hmm. against the Muslims. So when we put the, into context how unjustly and how evilly the people of that era were treating the Holy Prophet when he was already in a state of weakness. You see, in Arabia there was no there was no place where you could go to the court and have justice administered to you. These were barbaric, atrocious tribes who spilled the blood of whoever they felt. Every tribe was independent. And Western scholars have mentioned that the only way in order to survive in such a society was to take your own defensive mm. measures. So the Holy Prophet did that. But even then, if we read the history books, we see that the Holy Prophet always leaned towards a, a, a course of mercy. So this is the background of Khaybar and why the Holy Prophet imposed that a restriction of tax upon them. Jazakallah, Ya Saab. Dr. Saab, if I could come to you, I mean, Kay's got a couple of other questions. In part, they've been answered. I mean, one does refer specifically to this of how Jewish tribes mm. actually left Medina and that they were compelled, and that's why I did ask about what the circumstances were, and I think that's very clear. Um, <clears throat> but she then sort of asks a question, which is, in modern day practice, it's true, you know, that you find that when you go to the holy places, particularly to Mecca mm -hmm. um, in Saudi Arabia, that you won't find that uh, non-Muslims are not allowed to enter there. And she genuinely asks that that's a practice which is prevalent today. And how would people feel if, for example, um, cities such as uh, Rome, for example, uh, where the Vatican City is, that was, you know, uh, put off limits to... Uh, Muslims. I know I've been to the Vatican City and looked at the history of mm -hmm. it and the setup, and certainly it was open to all, well, within reasons, of course, there's certain things which are off limits to everyone. But the fact is a one of openness. Here is a Muslim city of Mecca. It is not open in the modern age to non-Muslims. Here is a Christian city of the Vatican City, a Catholic center of the world, yet even some of the key parts of it are open to all. Why the differentiation? Well, we have to uh, lay this background onto the governments of the present time who are responsible for these, enacting these laws. And if the present government of Saudi Arabia has enacted a law that it does not allow non-Muslims to enter Mecca or Medina, then we cannot bring it back to the Holy Prophet wasallam or the teachings of Islam on which we base our answers. We cannot answer for the Saudis it may be for the benefit of the protection of these holy places that they have enacted these laws. But as far as religiously, and we're talking in terms of the Holy Quran and the practice of the Holy Prophet wasallam, we can categorically tell Kay and our non-Muslim uh, friends out there that Islam in the Holy Quran in no way is not a verse of the Holy Quran which alludes to the fact that non-Muslims are not permitted to enter Mecca and Medina. In fact, in the life of the Holy Prophet wasallam, we, we see examples of how in Ayah Sab has very eloquently told us about the conditions of Medina where there were different religious denominations who were living in peace amongst each other and there was no question of them not being allowed. In fact, let's look at the mosque of the Prophet yes, the, in, in Medina. Um, the Holy Prophet's mosque in Medina is very dear to all Muslims because of the association we have with the Prophet And not only did he receive non-Muslims in that mosque, the Christians of Najran came to him and stayed with him mm -hmm. uh, to discuss matters of religion. And when it was time for them to worship, even he allowed them to come into the mosque and to continue their worship with their, their art, with, in their own way, mm -hmm. with their artifacts and with their crosses and crucifixes. So this is the example of the Prophet wasallam that he did not bar any non-Muslims from enter, entering the mosque. Another... I'm sorry, Dr. Saab, also, and they didn't accept after their discussion with the Holy Prophet. They came as Christians and they left as Christians and no compulsion was so put there, upon there them. So there was no 
religious conversion. There was no religious conversion at that time, and the verse of the Holy Quran, "Lakum dinokum waliyadim." For your, for you, your religion. For me, my religion. And these are the terms on which they they parted. So there was no coercion in in that respect. Let's look at Mecca also. I mean, look at the fall of Mecca when the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam entered Mecca uh, at, at that time. Many of the idolaters had had thinking that they were not safe to remain in Mecca had left. Ikrama was the son of Abu Jahal, a very bitter opponent of Islam, of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. And Ikrama had actually left Mecca to seek refuge there. But Ikrama's wife came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, um, Muhammad ﷺ, Ikrama has fleed Mecca for his safety. He was an idolater. And she said that, uh, what is the situation with him? And the Prophet ﷺ said, not only should he come back to, to Mecca, but we guarantee his security in Mecca, knowing that he was an idolater, that he, should, he could come back to Mecca. And this was relayed to Ikrama, who then returned to Mecca as an idolater. So this is the example of the Prophet Wasallam that he even permits an idolater to come back to Mecca and live in peace and guarantees his security as well at that time. Zakallah, I mean, again, we have another question apart from uh, Kay's question and thank you Kay for your series of questions I trust you'll agree with me they've been answered uh, in a very full way by our two panelists but uh, Farzan Ahmed Sahib from Marisa in India asked much the same question that does Islam allow non-believers um, and I think that's an interesting phrase he uses but I think very much means non-Muslims because we maintain of course that other faiths at their start at their inception very much are from the same God and we respect other faiths and communities. But does Islam allow non-Muslims to enter the places of Mecca, Medina, which you've covered? But it's, it's something which, as you said, is a modern day mm. practice, whatever the reasons are, and obviously protection may well be one of them. Um, but it's not something that was in any way. And pra was that when, I mean, it's, you know, when you look over history or whatever, even the time of the Khulafai Rashid, uh, Rashidin, the caliphs of the Holy Prophet, was it the same then as well? Was it prevalent then that you, whilst there were challenges made to Islam, of course, Islam was constantly under attack as well from other forces, but the openness, was that maintained? I mean, that is something that we know that in, in, in uh, Makkah and Medina, uh, both the centers, during the time of the four righteous caliphs, they also enacted the same freedom that was given by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They have o <coughs> over, the, over the centuries been very genuine threats from non-Muslims uh, that about the destruction of the Kaaba and so on. The Kaaba is very dear in that respect that it is the house of Allah and we obviously attain, attach much significance to that. But as far as religiously concerned and during the time of the Caliphs, the freedom was still given to people of n not, no faith or um, non-Muslims also to enter into these holy places as well. Jazakumullah, gentlemen. Um, we're going to move on to our next question. Um, unfortunately, I think our questioners are uh, forgotten in this instance to actually put their name down. But nevertheless, they raise um, important points. So we will be including these questions. The first one is over the whole issue of institutionalized slavery. Um, and the, our questioner here has ra uh, sort of mentioned and flagged a, a hadith from Sahih Bukhari, um, which he then narrates here. But in essence, it's, uh, it's talking of freeing a slave girl, um, that she was freed, but that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said at that time that greater heavenly reward would have been given to her had she been given slave to one of her uncles, thus keeping the slave in slavery. That's the assertion being made here. Yasab, if I could come to you with this. It's one of the things which we hear constantly, which was propagated about Islam in terms of the rights Islam gave. And one of them was to deinstitutionalize, to do away with the concept of this kind of compounded sort of thing that had happened over years and years about slavery. Um, we know from the example of the Holy Prophet himself وسلم, that he actually took slaves, released them and actually then took them into his own household as well. So this hadith, how does that all sort of tally up? We can reconcile and tally up all of these issues, but 
as I always say, everything needs to be understood in context. Mm -hmm. Isolating one statement or one instance and making a conclusion based on that will, of course, give us incorrect results. If we look at the state of Arabia 1400 years ago mm -hmm. when slavery was prevalent, we would see that slaves were taken in a very unjust manner. Free people, when a tribe would go and pillage and plunder somewhere, mm -hmm. they would make free people into slaves. They would take their women and children and use them as slaves and they would also take their free men as slaves as well. This was a practice that was so abhorrent to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and Islam that he would always contemplate upon how slaves could be freed and how they could be mm -hmm. become beneficial members of society once again. But we must understand that in Arabia and in all nations in that era, 1400 years ago, slavery was prevalent for such a long time that slaves were slaves and then their children when they were born they would directly be born into a life of slavery. If a slave had a child his master would consider him to be a slave as well, the child as well. So so many generations of slavery upon slavery had come and gone that slavery was such that there were many slaves in that era who didn't know anything other than slavery. They knew not what freedom was. They were born slaves and lived their entire lives as, as slaves and they died as slaves. When the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, came, he institutionalized something, but it definitely wasn't slavery. It was the institutionalization of the manumission of slaves, of freeing slaves. But Tariq Saab, everything needs to be done in such a manner that the results come out to be positive. Mm -hmm. If we follow an institution which results in greater harm than good, then what use is that situation, that institution? <coughs> we see that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, many people object and say that, well, people like Abraham Lincoln and other reformers came and freed all of the slaves at once and Islam didn't free all of the slaves at once. Mm -hmm. that there's a reason why the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, taught that slaves should all not be freed at once. As I mentioned, at the time, slavery was so prevalent in certain groups of society that if all of the slaves had been freed at once, they would have a very negative effect on society because <clears throat> they would become a burden on society. So the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, taught that before a slave is freed, he should be trained, educated, taught, and so much so that the Holy Prophet said that a slave, if he does not know how to perform a skill or a trade or labor, he should be taught that so that when he is freed, he can earn a living for himself. So it's almost empowering them before exactly. to be self-sufficient. Exactly. That and that's what the Holy Prophet taught. You see, there's a very famous statement of Jesus Christ. He says that a tree can be judged by its fruits. And if we analyze both of these systems, the Western system of liberating all of the slaves at once, as Abraham Lincoln and other reformers did, we will see that that manumission had a negative effect on society. If we historically study the era in which all of these slaves in America were freed, they resorted to crime, they didn't have an education, so they couldn't even earn a living for themselves. But let's look at the Muslim system of manumission. When the Holy Prophet freed slaves slowly and gradually after training them and teaching them, these slaves, who were slaves in one era, became leaders of the Muslims. And Muslims accepted them as leaders. Do you know Zaid bin Haritha, who was a slave at one point? He was the commander in many military campaigns and great companions were under him. Then we see people like Hazrat Bilal radiallahu anhu, who was also a slave. He received such a high status in society that when he passed away, Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu, who was the Khalifa of the time, said that today a chieftain from among the Muslims has passed away. Then we find that other slaves who were slaves at one time, when they were freed, they became scholars of jurisprudence, they became scholars of hadith, they became great scholars of uh, uh, <coughs> recitation of the Holy Quran, and many people today follow them and benefit from their guidance. So this is why Islam taught that slaves should be freed slowly and gradually. If the Holy Prophet ever said that a certain slave should not be freed yet, the only reason for that was because that the Holy Prophet said that perhaps that slave has at this time not developed the skills which are necessary for him or her to live a beneficial life in society when he or she is freed. You know Tariq Sahib, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, has mentioned something. 
he has said that a person who has a slave and she is a female if that person trains her educates her and frees her and then after she is freed gives her the choice and if she decides to marry her master out of her own free will that person would get a double reward because not only has that person taken somebody and trained that person out of a life of slavery but he has also given that slave a sense of dignity and respect by choosing by accepting to marry that person mm -hmm. because in that era slaves were treated very unjustly mm -hmm. even if we analyze the manner in which slaves were treated when they were in their state of slavery before they were manumitted we will see that the Muslims gave them so much love and dignity that other Western scholars, Western thinkers and Western societies did not give their slaves that dignity in society. For example, there is a narration that once Hazrat Ali who was with his slave and took him to the market. And he bought two shirts. Mm -hmm. And he said to the slave that these are two shirts, pick the one that you like first. And the slave picked one and then Hazrat Ali took the one that was left. So even to this degree, that whatever the Muslims chose for themselves or whatever they bought for themselves, they gave an equal treatment to their slaves as well. So even their life of slavery was very wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then slowly when their mental faculties developed to such a degree that they could become beneficial members of society, the Holy Prophet instructed that they should be freed. And we see that historically it is proven that the companions would go around and spend money to buy slaves just for the purpose of freeing them and thousands and thousands of slaves were freed in this manner in a society where slaves were treated like animals. And again, it then highlights what the reasoning behind, what, uh, behind this particular incident was. Um, again, the same question, uh, Sahib, he's raised various questions, but one of his uh, next questions is that Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. we've been talking about this in this program and indeed previous programs that there were many laws which were brought forward we've talked about the Islamic form of governance um, we've previously touched upon the issue of marriage within Islam and uh, how many wives I mean this is quite topical in the modern age as well that uh, as the exception and under certain circumstances qualifying circumstances men living under an Islamic system and Islamic under Islamic where Islamic jurisprudence is prevailing um, in Muslim countries are allowed uh, under exceptional circumstances to take more than one wife. And the questioner is quoting the relevant verse from the Holy Quran which actually gave that instruction and the important facets of treating all your wives justly and um, the necessity behind it. Yet the insinuation he is making from the question subsequently mm -hmm. is that here was this Quranic verse, it was revealed it was something that the Holy Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, propagated. Yet did he follow it to the letter? And he is looking at the historical nature of the Holy Prophet of Islam taking more than one wife, which he did. And that the letter which was being revealed in this particular verse of the Holy Quran wasn't being followed uh, by, God forbid, the Holy Prophet. That's the allegation mm -hmm. being made. Yeah, the, the subject of the plurality of wives is something that has to be looked at in its context and through history um, and we, when we look at the the lives of the prophets previous to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam look at the time of uh, Hazrat uh, Suleiman we are told that the number of wives was uh, in the hundreds mm -hmm. you know so when we look at the life of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we should keep in mind all of these factors in, in that sense in that at the time of the Holy Prophet وسلم, this was also a custom in Arabia that men had uh, a number of wives numbering hundreds and the Holy Quran actually has brought this fo uh, subject to focus and has actually focused that men have to treat women or wives very justly and very equally and the verse of the Holy Quran that he does quote as regards marrying more than one wife there is a stipulation in this verse also that if you cannot treat your wives equally then you should only marry one 
and then historically we know that the marriage to more than one wife is very in exceptional circumstances and this is not a, a, a commandment that is given as a freedom for all to marry more than one wife. So that Muslims, if they are to marry more than one wife, number one, they have to be very strict in their justice and treatment to all their wives and if humanly not possible, then it is forbidden in fact for them to marry more than one wife. So this is something that I think non-Muslims should understand this subject from, from that angle. As far as the life of the Holy Prophet ﷺ himself and the fact that he had more than four wives at, at, at one time is not contrary to this verse of the Holy Quran. The Holy Prophet ﷺ did everything with divine guidance and with divine permission to do something. And in the Holy Quran there are exceptions that are laid down for him for the Holy Prophet ﷺ for special conditions which were only pertinent, applied only, only to the Holy Prophet ﷺ. What we have to always consider is that the wives of the Holy Prophet ﷺ had a very special status in society and in religion for many, many reasons. And we generally known, uh, known as Ummul Mu'mineen, the mother of the faithful. So we have to also bear that in mind. It is interesting that in the Holy Quran, the Holy Prophet ﷺ is said to address his wife and say to them that if you like the embellishments and the ornaments of this world, then I can give you those and you can separate from me. But if you would like to stay with me in this austere life of Islam and continue to be married to me, then that is your choice. Mm -hmm. What did all of his wives do? They all elected, selected to remain dedicated and devoted to the Prophet ﷺ, and this must have been for their special treatment and conditions that they always had. So this was their choice as such. Not only that, but the Holy Quran speaks of that if a wife of the Holy Prophet ﷺ makes an error, then her punishment is twice that of an ordinary woman. So in the face of this, they, despite all these difficulties, wanted to stay with the married, continued married to the Holy Prophet ﷺ. So if he had, uh, if this was the only verse of the Holy Quran which limited wives to four, then he, if he had to divorce any of his wives, number one, because they were Ummul Mu'minin and the special status that they had in society, they would not have been able to remarry again and to live their life in, in peace at that time. So that would not, that would in fact have not been kind treatment of his wives for him to have put them through that. But what does Allah command him to do? There is a verse of the Holy Quran, and like you just read the translation of that. It is a commandment of Allah from Surah Al Ahzab, verse 53, addressed to the Holy Prophet. ﷺ. Very categoric. Allah says, It is not allowed thee to marry women after that, after this commandment had been given, nor to change them for any other wives, even though their goodness please thee. This is revealed in the seventh uh, after Hijrah. So he was not permitted to divorce any existing wife as they could not have been remarried. So this is a commandment of Allah for particular, for the whole, addressed to the Holy Prophet wasallam, giving him exception to have more than four wives, whereas the Surah of Surah Nisa was three is a generalization to Muslims in general and Allah has given permission to the Holy Prophet wasallam, to retain all seven wives for those particular reasons that it would have been unkind to divorce those, those women at that time. Dr. Saab, another thing, mm. if you permit me, t people always raise this objection that God forbid the wives of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, were a means in which he gratified his luxury and lust, God forbid. But I ask my friends who think of this, of, of the Holy Prophet in this manner, that practically, how much time out of a 24-hour day did the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, spend with his wives? If we read the narrations of the Ahadith, which are authentic narrations and historians accept them, we see that the Holy Prophet all day long would be busy in his works as a teacher and as a prophet and training his companions. Or he would be busy defending himself because of the onslaughts of the disbelievers. And at night time, the Holy Prophet ﷺ would not spend a life of luxury. Mm. One time, there is a narration that Hazrat Aisha radiallahu anha, she woke up in the middle of the night and she found that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, was not by her side. So she turned on the light and she looked 
and she found the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, in prostration on the ground. He was praying, and he would spend almost his whole night praying and supplicating, so much so that one day, one of his wives asked him, O Messenger of Allah, you stand in the night and pray so much that your feet become swollen. Why do you do this when Allah has promised to forgive your shortcomings? He says, the Holy Prophet wasallam says, then shall I not be a thankful servant of Allah the Almighty? And it is narrated that the Holy Prophet would cry and weep as if a pot was boiling on the stove. For what? For the forgiveness of people like me and you. Mm -hmm. For the forgiveness of people who are living a life of weakness. And so that he could pray that other people who are not Muslims could be guided towards the one truthful God. This is what he prayed for. So this category, this lifestyle of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, was f which was far from luxury, mm -hmm. substantiates and establishes categorically that the reason for his numerous marriages was something else. And Dr. Sahib has very beautifully and eloquently mentioned those reasons. And another point which also would uh, uh, add to Dr. Sahib's uh, wonderful explanation is that the Holy Prophet was a teacher. And through his wives, he carried out the work of training the women who were Muslims. There are certain religious injunctions which are very difficult, which relate directly to women, which it would have been difficult for the Holy Prophet to convey directly or for women to ask the Holy Prophet directly because of a barrier of modesty and shame. So through the wives of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, these specific injunctions which related to women were transferred to the women of the Muslim community. And we see that the reason for this was so that after the demise of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his wives could carry on his teaching and his training. And we see practically that this happened. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, said that you can learn half of your faith from Aisha. And it is categorically established that after the people raised great objections against the marriage with Hazrat Aisha. But what did Hazrat Aisha do after the demise of the Holy Prophet? She lived for many, many years. And many great companions would come to Hazrat Aisha to ask her religious questions. And one scholar, one a great Muslim of that era, he says that in knowledge of hadith, in knowledge of uh, the Quran, in knowledge of laws of inheritance, in other knowledge of poetry, I have never seen a scholar greater than Aisha. Where did she learn all of these things? She learned them from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And that scholar goes on to say, that Muslim says, that I have never found any question which has been posed to Aisha with regards to religious injunctions for which she has not had an answer. So this is why the Holy Prophet married more than four wives, so that the training and teaching of the Arab society could be done in a very wonderful manner. And we see practically that after the demise of the Holy Prophet and even in the life of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, such a grand transformation came in the Arabs of that day and age that the results are unparalleled. Jazakallah, gentlemen. I think that's a very comprehensive, detailed, full answer again. And I think this is a contentious issue to, to a lot of people when they look at it from a particular perspective indeed. It's unfortunate that we do see uh, on occasions uh, very derogatory attacks on the noble character of the Holy Prophet, uh, peace be upon him indeed. You know, most recently we've seen attacks through this rather disgusting and vile film which was produced. But I think it's important to look at these answers in full to ensure that I do hope and pray that our viewers um, can fully understand the noble character and personage that was Prophet Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We're going to continue. This is not so much an allegation, but more uh, information. I, I would. It's a better way of phrasing this particular question. It comes from Farzan Ahmed Saab, who did ask a, a previous question as well from Arissa in India. Um, there's certain places within uh, the Islamic world, uh, Ya Saab, which are perceived as being holy. Uh, uh, well, not just within the Islamic world, in other faiths as well, but with particular reference to Islam. Mecca and Medina, for example, are often quoted as the holy cities, rightly so, and, and the Muslim community firmly and absolutely 100% subscribe to that. And in addition to that, we believe in the Amdiya Muslim community that the promised Messiah, who was awaited by all faiths, has now come and ar arisen in Qadian. And there is his place where he used to pray, which is called Battle Dua in Qadian. Our questioner, Farzan Ahmed, um, who is a member of the Amdiya Muslim Jamaat, asks, 
what's the significance when people sort of, especially for all Muslims, when we go to Mecca, we wish to pray, uh, the significance of Hajj is well documented, but there is still that desire, that passion that to go to Mecca, and equally as an MD Muslim, those two places in uh, Saudi Arabia do not in any way diminish in their rank, they remain prevalent, but there is a sense that because the promised Messiah was born in Qadiyan, that there is a sense for that affection to go to Battle Dua where he used to pray as well. Is there a sort of religious significance, or is there more strength in pl praying in these places as opposed to other places? Well, anybody who has read poetry will find that often when a lover is speaking about his beloved, he always talks about the places that his beloved lived, the house in which he lived, or even the streets and alley where that person used to walk. And even that is looked <coughs> upon with affection and love. Because it is impossible for you to love something or somebody and not love those things which are also attached to that person. And this is a phenomenon which we see in religion as well. Religion is founded on principles of love. And the promised Messiah has said that love which we experience in this world for other relations is actually a manifestation of the love of God. So love is something which attracts you not only towards your beloved, but towards those things which that beloved person was attached to as well. And this is why we have significance in our heart, great significance and love and veneration for places like Makkah and Medina and for Qadian, because these are where our beloved people came and lived a greater part of their life. So there is no doubt that these places have a great significance as far as our emotions and our feelings of love are concerned. But one thing which must be understood is that also the Promised Messiah has mentioned that it is a divine custom of Allah the Almighty that if a person is beloved in the sight of God, all of those things which he is attached to also become blessed as well. For example, the Promised Messiah says that when a person advances and progresses in, in his relationship with God the Almighty and he becomes a beloved servant of Allah the Almighty, the home in which he lives becomes blessed. Allah begins to send down a spiritual rain of blessings upon that place. The city in which he lives becomes blessed. The clothes that he wears becomes blessed. The people that he touches are also, it, it becomes a source of blessing for those people because he is a manifestation of Allah's uh, divine countenance, if you will, in this world. So there are blessings attached to these places and if we go to these places with the intention that this is a place where a very beloved man of God lived and prayed and his prayers were accepted and by my being here and praying to Allah the Almighty I may also benefit from those divine blessings then this is a very pure and wholesome thought indeed. But we must not take this to a level of shirk or polytheism or association with God the Almighty as if those things in themselves are so blessed that they are fulfilling our needs. Because as far as our needs and our prayers and supplications are concerned, there is only one being who provides for us and that is Allah the Almighty. If we think that if I'm in Bayt dua and I pray, then my prayer will be accepted, as but opposed else, as opposed yeah. to somewhere else, mm. then this means that we have taken God out of the equation mm. and Bayt dua oh. God forbid, has become our God. Bayt dua is a very wonderful place of great blessings and we can benefit from those blessings, but only on the condition that we recognize the fact that if this place is blessed, then it is also because of the blessings of Allah the Almighty. And if Allah is outside of the equation, then these physical things mean nothing. Mm -hmm. So our sights should always be set on that ultimate cause, which is Allah the Almighty. This is why Allah the Almighty says in the Holy Quran that, فَأَيْنَ مَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ That Allah is the owner of the East and He is the owner of the West. Mm -hmm. And wherever you turn, you will find the countenance of God. So we can pray and develop a relationship with Allah the Almighty anywhere. You see, the blessings, Khalifa Rabir Ayyamullah Ta'ala, the fourth Khalifa of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, mentioned something very beautiful. He said that these places and, or these things which are blessed, only such people can derive benefit from these blessings if they themselves have purity of heart. And he gave the example that, for example, 
Makkah and Medina are very blessed places. But Abu Jahal lived in Makkah. Mm. And people who were uh, idolaters and were conspir conspirators against the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, lived in Medina as well. They did not benefit from the blessings of the Holy Prophet. They did not benefit from the blessings of those places because they had one, ma one major defect. And that defect was the purity of their heart mm -hmm. because they had decided that no matter what happens, we are going to oppose Muhammad, peace be upon him, and we are going to uproot his religion. So when we develop purity of heart, then Allah the Almighty also showers rain upon that pure heart. And then the flowers and the greenery of faith begins to grow in those hearts. Jazakumullah. Yeah, so that's again a very detailed and poetic answer as well. <laughs> and I think it puts it into context for viewers because quite often, especially those perhaps uh, who don't follow any particular religion, to put it in that very personal context, perhaps... Uh, allows them to in gain an insight. Um, one small clarification, and I think it's an important one, Doc, so I'll very briefly, if I could ask you, that the, the, the place of Mecca, specifically in Islam, and the pilgrimage of Hajj, is, it's the act of the Hajj to the pilgrimage, the first, as we regard as the house of God, which is there. That's incumbent on all Muslims as part of their obligations in Islam. And I think just for our viewers' benefit to highlight that, and sometimes against the Amdiya Muslim community, mm -hmm. there is an allegation raised that we somehow elevate right, right. the city of Qadian, which was the birthplace of the promised Messiah, to the same level. That is, of course, not true, but just for the benefit and the sake of clarity, I think it's an important point to make. Yes, I think Ayaz Sab has very, very clearly, very eloquently uh, brought to home the significance of these relics and as far as Makkah is concerned I mean it is a special significance not only in the history of Islam but in the history of mankind because we believe that it was the first house that was built uh, on earth for the worship of Allah and going from that foundation we, re we know and we have seen in the history and the, in the history of Islam the importance of Makkah in, in, in that respect and because of our affection and love and devotion to the Holy Prophet wasallam, and the religion of Islam where we Muslims have an obligation to perform the pilgrimage to the house of Allah if possible in our lifetime at least once a pillar of Islam this is the importance we attached to the pilgrimage to the house of Allah and nothing can come anyway close to that and as you have said that Qadian of course is the birthplace of the Prophet Muhammad but in no way has the significance and the importance that Makkah has for us Ahmadis and Muslims in that respect and each day we pray and we pray we face the Kaaba into that respect and that signifies to us the importance of the Kaaba over all other things in that respect. Dr. Saad, if you permit me people raise the objection that the promised Messiah came and established Qadian as a headquarters and now Mecca and Medina are out of the equation. Let's put things into context. One time the promised Messiah was lying on his bed and he was praying and supplicating and because in that era the scholars of Mecca had issued edicts that if Mirza Ghulam Ahmed or any other Ahmadi or follower comes to Qadian their punishment is death. So the promised Messiah couldn't go to Mecca to perform the Hajj. And his wife, Hazrat Umul Mu'mineen, Hazrat Nusrat Jahan Begum Sahiba was talking to her father about Hajj and about Makkah. And the promised Messiah began to weep and tears started to flow from his eyes. And when he was asked why he was crying, he be, in a very heavy voice, he said, you started mentioning Makkah and Medina and I began to think, that will I ever have the opportunity to go and visit that blessed place where my master Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spent so much of his life and then I feel that maybe it will not be possible for me to go there. So these were the emotions of the Promised Messiah and he transferred those emotions into each and every Ahmadi. Sure. Gentlemen, I believe that was an important mm. clarification for the sake of our viewers. Again, we are dealing with um, specific allegations which are sometimes made about Islam particularly and also on the Amdiya Muslim community. This con we're well sort of into the sort of last seven or eight minutes of the program but um, there's a question Dr. Saab we have from Sayyid Saab, Assalamu Alaikum Sayyid Saab from London um, who's written in asking about, this is a question we've probably covered off before as well on halal, um, the mm -hmm. concept of the halal method of slaughtering animals. Um, he then quotes 
that the halal method is perceived as being cruel, unlike the methods in the West, particularly where now in the modern age stunning is used. Islam insists on full consciousness. Um, he's saying for an animal before actually performing, uh, you know, the uh, the method of or making that meat and prescribe slaughtering that animal according to Islamic methods. Two elements to this, I suppose. One. Is it a cruel method? Why is this still used? Is it a humane way? And why isn't stunning perceived as something that can be sort of added into the process to allow the animal perhaps to lessen its, um, the cruelty that is perceived that's given to the animal at this time? It's slaughter. Nothing poetic about my answer, yeah. but uh, the Holy Prophet ﷺ was the mercy for the whole of the universe, not only for men, but also for the Allah's creation. And as far as uh, slaughtering an animal is concerned, he, he has actually left directions to minimize and spare the suffering to the animal that he's been, been slaughtered. Mm -hmm. And he said that let the one who is slaughtering sharpen his, his knife so that the act of slaughtering will minimize the suffering to, to the animal. So this is important for Muslims to obviously bear, bear that in mind. As far as stunning is concerned, then we have to look at it from all the perspectives and see how stunning is done and whether it does actually reduce the suffering to the animal or whether it increases the suffering to the, to the animal. Pain is a very difficult subject for man to understand as far as pain to humans is concerned. Even more difficult to understand when it becomes animals uh, who obviously cannot tell you that they are in, in pain as such. The practice of stunning actually was introduced not to minimize the suffering to the animal but to protect the slaughterhouse the abattoir staff from the animal who was being slaughtered so that is the background to why the animals were stunned there are several ways of stunning large animals and, and, and small animals and the, the stunning actually can either be done with a blow to the head or a bolt to the head um, and that actually sh gives a shock as a concussion to the brain so that there is loss of consciousness at that time. Nobody has actually said that that reduces the pain to the animal. Just because you physically cannot see that the animal is suffering does not mean to say that the animal is not suffering. It's human perception that that animal at that time so it merely immobilizes is the animal. It merely immobilizes the mm -hmm. animal and, be, and renders it unconscious at, at that time. Before it was rendered uh, unconscious, the animal could not have told you whether it was in pain. And after it's been uh, rendered immobile, it cannot tell you whether it is suffering any pain. Pitching was a, is a certain form of stunning where the, there was a, the bullet would actually pierce the skull and then a rod or a, a wire was passed into the brain to actually sort of kill off the brain at that time. And that actually was very cruel and has been, has been outlawed in many countries, pitching as such. Then there is electrified water for smaller animals whose, whose necks are sort of immersed in, in this. And that, I mean, causes drowning of the, a possible drowning of the animal to that degree. So all of these things are supposed to make it less painful for the animal, but it is debatable that this is, this is the case. The other thing that we uh, are not sure about is whether the animal actually, because of the electrical shock, the blow or the water does actually the card there is cardiac arrest and the animal is killed by that before the animal is slaughtered if that is the case then of course that is a dead animal that you're slaughtering and we would be against eating that the other thing is physical pain and mental pain mm -hmm. these are two pain, pain spheres that we know about psychologists know about and it is also well documented that animals suffer psychological mental pain after they have been stunned. So we may, be, we may think that they are, on, are in less pain, but science possibly tells us they are in greater pain because of the stunning. So the method of the Muslims as taught to us by the Holy Prophet Wasallam, to, to use a very sharp knife and to do the slaughter in a very quick okay. manner to let the blood out is possibly still the way that is more humane than the present day may is. I think the sharpness of the producers are that we're reaching the end of our program. It just falls upon me to thank both of you 
again for your very eloquent, detailed and scholarly answers and to thank our viewers of course for your questions. Without you, Faith Matters would not be the program it is. Just as a reminder once again of the email address, it's faithmatters at mta.tv. That's faithmatters at mta.tv. I end, if I may, we've talked about scholars um, within the Western Hemisphere. Alfonso de Lamartine, who was a French poet, writer of the 18th, 19th century, wrote about the Holy Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are his words, and I quote, philosopher, orator, apostle, legislator, warrior, conqueror of ideas, restorer of rational dogmas, of a cult without images, the founder of 20 terrestrial empires, and one main spiritual empire. That is Muhammad. As regards all standards by which human greatness may be measured, we may all well ask, is there any man greater than he? Until the next time, from all of us on Faith Matters, Assalamu Alaikum.